Welcome, uh, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Wouter Den Haan. I'm a professor here at the, uh, the London School of Economics. Uh, before we start, first a uh, couple announcements. So our guest, uh, John Kay, will uh, first introduce his new book, uh, Other People's Money. After this, there will be an opportunity for you to uh, ask some questions. And we expect the event to be over between quarter to eight, eight o'clock. Okay, so now everybody please turn, off, uh, turn your mobile on silent or turn it off. Uh, it's always kind of awkward if it goes off and uh, people around you start uh, casting angry glances at you. For those of you who do like to tweet, the <coughs> hashtag is LSE Econ, which is uh, on the slide. The event is being recorded, and if everything goes well, that should be available on the uh, LSE events webpage. Um, and then after the event, there is an opportunity to buy the book, I think, right? <clears throat> uh, so now let me turn to the more important parts of my job, and it's uh, a great pleasure to introduce our guest. Uh, John Kay is a fellow of the British Academy and a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He's probably best known as the uh, author of uh, several books and his uh, weekly column to the FT. But he has done much more in his life, uh, including academics. He's a visiting professor at the London School of Economics. He's worked in the private sector and he's also advised uh, the government. For example, in 2012, he chaired the review of UK equity markets and long-term decision making. Please uh, join me in welcoming our uh, guest. to people who don't know very much about finance often ask me, what is it that people in the city or on Wall Street actually do? And it's quite a good question. What they do, to an extent that is really quite astonishing, is they trade with each other. Just to give you some idea of the uh, scale of that, uh, we all know that world trade in goods and services has expanded rapidly. But actually, uh, trade on the world foreign exchange markets is a hundred times the volume of underlying trade in goods and services. The total volume of exposures which are subject to derivative contracts is about $700 trillion. If you find it hard to get your mind around $700 trillion, and you should, you should know that that's about three times the value of all the assets that exist in the world. If I look at the balance sheets of British banks, a lot of people still think that banks are institutions that take savings and deposit and lend them to business. Actually, lending to non-financial business <coughs> amounts to less than 3% of the total assets of British banks. Lending to other financial institutions amounts to 70% of it. And finally, those of you who um, have read Michael Lewis's latest little book called Flash Boys will know that a company called Spread Networks has recently built a telecoms link between Chicago and New York through the Appalachians whose effect is to reduce the time it takes to transmit data between Chicago and New York from 7.3 milliseconds to 6.6 .6 milliseconds. Just to give you an idea of uh, uh, the numbers we're talking about, the irreducible minimum for that is the time it takes to transmit light between Chicago and New York, which is about 4.3 milliseconds. No doubt they'll get a bit closer to that. In the, in the next year or two. What we've seen then is, um, sorry, where's, this is a very sophisticated mouse. Aha, thank you. What we've seen is a move over the last 30, 40 years, a process which other people have called, and although it's an ugly word, I've picked it up, a process of financialization. It's essentially a move from a banking world 
that was like this, the old-fashioned bank in which people did, in fact, place deposits that the bank then lent out to, to people who were doing business, to a world like this. This was um, Gordon Brown opening the brand new headquarters of Lehman Brothers in London in 2004, at which he would like to pay tribute, he said, to the company, contribution you and your company make to the prosperity of Britain. <laughs> this is Brown opening the plaque, and the man who is looking at what the plaque is going to say is actually Dick Fould. Oh, it was. Seem we've lost Dick Fould. Never mind. Well, we have the process of financialization, which has gone from uh, the old-fashioned bank, which I'm described, to the world that was characterized by Lehman Brothers, which, as you know, went bust in 2008. Never mind, we will manage. I've described the process of financialization, which is a process by which people in financial markets more and more trade with each other. What were they doing when they traded with each other? And the fact that they trade with each other ought to raise two questions for everyone in this audience. Suppose I were to lock the doors of this room and we were all to spend the rest of the evening exchanging bits of paper with each other. You would think that the total value of the bits of paper which we would have when we left the room at the end of the evening would be pretty much the same as the value of the bits of paper which we had when we came into the room at the beginning of the evening. That seems common sense. And what's wrong with that common sense? That is, what is the value which is being added as a result of this activity, of this process of people trading with each other? The second question, which you might ask yourself, is why is this activity so apparently so extraordinarily profitable, or apparently so extraordinarily profitable? We know that actually the finance sector gives people some of the largest wages and salaries which occur in any aspect of economic activity. Well, let's think about that for a moment and um, imagine uh, that we start this process of trading with each other. I have a bit of paper here. It has a heading on it called Extremely Complicated Financial Instruments. Uh, I would like to sell it to someone uh, in, um, in this audience. Uh, you don't know very much about what it is. You don't know very much about what it does. The legal documentation underpinning it runs to a thousand pages or so, and I'm willing to bet there is, there is no one in the world who has ever read that bit of paper through, uh, the, the, that document through. But all you need to know about the bit of paper is that this bit of paper offers a rate of return which is 1% uh, uh, higher than the rate of return you can earn on US Treasury bonds. Uh, and it is just as safe as U.S. Treasury bonds. Now, I know that Professor Berglov is too shrewd to buy this particular uh, piece of paper, but Bernard down there, I'm sure you would like to buy this piece of paper I, for... I was well taught by you. I would never touch it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but surely you could manage to pass it on to your neighbors, couldn't you? <laughs> I'm sure there are several people in the room who would not only buy this bit of paper from you, but actually be happy to trade it on at a premium, wouldn't they? Uh, <laughs> there are no friends in this world, I'm afraid. Now, what's happening, right? And I'm sure when you do pass it on, you will not only make a profit on it for your employer, but you will expect to be rewarded for that payment which you've made, uh, which you've made. 
Now, this can then be passed along the row of the audience here, and everyone in the row can pick up a small profit as they successfully sell this particular bit of paper on to somebody else. And I'm sure you on the other side of the room are now anxious to get in on, the, in on the game. Look, everyone down here is making some money by trading this bit of paper along the row. If you have any sense, you can't wait to get hold of it. I started to understand this process when I read back a book by Kenneth Galbraith on the, the great crash, the Wall Street crash of 1929, in which Galbraith described the concept of the bezel. What the bezel was, was the imaginary wealth that exists in the moments between the time at which an embezzler or a fraudster has stolen some money and the time at which the people from whom he has stolen it discover that they have lost it. For that interval, the world is better off because that wealth is being counted twice. And that concept of the bezel is essential to understanding the process which we're describing here and the process of passing uh, bits of paper along this room. What we are doing when we engage in that, and I've described simply the crudest version of it, which in its illegal form is actually called a Ponzi scheme, the business of passing bits of paper along to each other at ever-increasing prices is a way of borrowing money from the future. Because at the end of the evening, someone in the room is going actually to look at the bit of paper which they have and discover it wasn't actually worth very much at all. That the profits which we made over that period are in large part imaginary. Charlie Munger, who is Warren Buffett's uh, business partner, Buffett, many of you will know, is probably the most successful history investor in the history of the world. Munger invented the concept of the, the fee bezel which was the functionally equivalent bezel in these terms. The fee bezel is essentially a legal bezel. And there are a whole variety of ways in which one can make money in this mechanism, essentially by borrowing it from the future. I often drive on French auto routes. I have a house in France. And if you have ever ridden, um, driven on a French auto route, you will know that if you drive at less than 20 kilometers an hour above the legal speed limit, there will be someone on your tail bumper flashing his lights and inviting you to get out of his way. The thing about that tailgating strategy is that 99% of the time, tailgating actually works. That is, the person who tailgates you gets to his destination a minute or two earlier than he otherwise would. You also notice that one time in a thousand, it doesn't work, and you see the remains of uh, crashed cars at the side of French auto routes. But actually, when it doesn't work, or when people see it not working, there is a kind of cognitive dissonance that sets in, a cognitive dissonance that has a relevant source, because actually, typically, there is some other proximate cause of the accident which, uh, uh, which led to the tailgating resulting in disaster. There was an obstruction on the road. Someone else made a mistake or something of that kind. The tailgating strategy is sometimes described as picking up dimes from under a steamroller. It's an activity that generates a stream of small profits which are punctuated by occasional large losses. And if you have in your mind concepts like uh, tailgating and the bezel, you will start to see the mechanisms by which we can conjure up imaginary wealth so that even if we are really no richer when we leave this room at the end of the evening, we can leave this room at the end of the evening believing that we are richer. Simple explanation, or simple description rather, of what happened in the years from 2003 to 2008 is that banks uh, announced they had made very large profits, paid a substantial fraction of these very large profits to their senior employees, and then announced in 2008 that it all had all been a, a mistake, more or less wiped out their shareholders, and received taxpayer support in order to keep the system 
uh, the functioning. We borrowed money from the future, and then the future came. That is the story of how we created this imaginary world. I want to start from an entirely different angle than this evening. Instead of asking the question, uh, what, what is it that people in the finance sector actually do, I want to ask, what is it that the finance sector is actually for? And if I can use this, I think we can go back and see what it is. If we are pose the question to ourselves, what do we actually want finance to do for us? Then there are, I think, four things that finance can contribute to the non-financial economy. And let us all be clear that we need a financial sector, that countries that have undeveloped financial sector, it's one of the direct causes of poverty in these countries. Above all, we need a finance sector to manage our payment system. That is to enable us to receive wages and salaries, to pay our bills, and for businesses to deal with each other. We need a payment system, and that is actually what the majority of people who are employed in finance actually do. One of the things about the vilification of bankers uh, in, in the last decade has been that most people who are bankers are not actually masters of the universe on million-dollar salaries. Uh, they are people doing relatively mundane clerical jobs in branches of banks and insurance companies. Half of all the employees of Barclays Bank earn less than £25,000 a year. At the other end of the spectrum, however, I estimate that the top 1% of employees in Barclays Bank probably receive about 40% of the total remuneration of everyone who works for that particular bank. That is, the 1% about which we've heard so much actually reaches its most extreme manifestation in the financial sector. The second thing we want our finance system to do is to facilitate our wealth management. We want it, uh, we all of us, when we're young, consume more than we earn. We, most of us, when we're old, consume uh, more than we earn. We can only make that work if there's a bit in the middle in which we do the opposite. We need a finance sector to enable us to spread our consumption and our income over time. We need a finance sector to do capital allocation. We need it to take our savings and transmit these savings into the physical capital stock of the, of the country. And finally, the finance sector can help us with risk mit mitigation. And I'm not going to have time this evening to talk about all four of these functions. I want, in what I have to say tonight, to you tonight, to focus on two of them, capital allocation and risk mitigation. Let me start, then, by, taking, by talking about uh, risk mitigation. Not many people have a strong claim to have uh, predicted the financial crisis of 2008. In fact, rather few. But one of the people who has uh, uh, a claim on these lines is uh, a man called Raj Raghan, who was at the time chief economist at the International Monetary Fund and is now governor of the Reserve Bank of India. And there was a the uh, Reserve, Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas holds an annual conference at Jackson Hole in Wyoming, a rather agreeable ski resort in the, uh, in the edges of the Teton Mountains. And at that, conf that conference in 2005 was essentially a celebration to, uh, moving towards Alan Greenspan's retirement uh, as chairman of the Federal Reserve Board in the United States. Rajan delivered a paper in which he was skeptical about some of the financialization process which I've described, and in particular spelled out what I've described as the tailgating strategy, the picking up dimes from under a steamroller, by which people find strategies which generate sequences of profits which are punctuated by occasional cra crashes. But what Rajan said was rather ill-received. There was a discussant for Rajan's paper, a man called Don Cohen, and Cohen responded to say, by allowing institutions to diversify risk, 
to choose their risk profiles more precisely, to improve the management of the risks they take on. These innovations have made institutions more robust. As a result, he said, the financial system is more resilient and flexible, better able to absorb shocks without increasing the effect of such shocks on the real economy. That was indeed Greenspan's view. They called it at that conference the Greenspan Doctrine. And it wasn't just Cohn who held it, and another man, another Federal Reserve Board governor called Ben Bernanke chair added that banking organizations of all sizes have made substantial strides over the past two decades in their ability to measure and manage risks. Such advances he resulted, he said, in greater resilience of the banking system. Another uh, attendee at the conference, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, a man called Tim Geithner, went on to say that financial institutions are able to measure and manage risk much more effectively. Risks are spread more widely across a more diverse group of financial intermediaries within and across countries. These changes have contributed to a substantial improvement in the financial strength of the core financial intermediaries and in the overall flexibility and resilience of the financial system in the United States. How could they have been so wrong? That's one question that this should pose to you. The other question which it should pose to you, or rather observation which you might make on it, is that being so wrong actually proved no obstacle to the subsequent careers of the individuals concerned. Uh, Bernanke was two years later appointed chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, Cohen was appointed his deputy. And Tim Geithner, in 2008, succeeded to the post of U.S. Treasury Secretary, which he occupied for the following five years. There was an uh, an economist who gave a lecture here, I think, 30 years ago, which he entitled The Unimportance of Being Right. Uh, And he well understood what is required to achieve promotion in particular organizations. How could they have got it so wrong? Well, I think you can find a clue to that in a book which was written 20 years ago by a French economist who actually moved outside the academic world to become chairman of one of France's largest insurance companies, a man called Michel Albert. And Michel Albert explained that there were essentially two origins of the world insurance industry. One was in Lloyd's coffee shop in London. And those of you who know anything about the history of London insurance will know that Edward Lloyd uh, was the proprietor of a coffee shop in which English gentlemen would get together to gamble. They'd gamble on the fate of ships in particular. They would also gamble on people's lives, how long George George, George I would live for, and questions like that. The second origin, he said, was actually in Switzerland, and it was in the Alpine meadows where Swiss villagers would get together and agree that if their animals died, they would all club together to buy new ones. There's something in that caricature, and it is the case today that on the one hand, London is still a major insurance market, largely centered around uh, Lloyds of London, and these Swiss villagers who mutualized the risks which they shared have descended from their alpine villages and now run the world's largest reinsurance companies in Zurich and Munich. That's how insurance came into being. And in trading risks, there are two kinds of things going on. One is what the people were doing in Lloyd's coffee shop, which was essentially mediating different views about what was going to happen in future with each other, gambling, if one puts it crudely. And the other was the Swiss village exercise, the Swiss village of the story of mutualization. That contrast actually uh, became real in the late 1990s when there was invented one of the complex financial instruments which I was describing, something called the credit default swap, 
<coughs> the credit default swap was essentially a promise to pay out if an uh, issuer of a bond defaulted on it. And the International Securities and Derivatives Association, which wanted to encourage trading in these particular instruments, asked the London QC to determine what these kind of instruments were. Were they insurance or were they gambling? If they were insurance, then they would, of course, fall under insurance regulation, insurance law, and be taxed as insurance policies. Or were they gambling? In which case, they would be regulated as bets and be taxed and regulated according to the rules of gambling. Well, those of you who have ever acquired a QC will know that he has a very high propensity to give the opinion which you want him to give. And this case was no exception. Mr. Potts shrewdly decided that a, a credit default swap was neither gambling nor insurance. He didn't make it entirely clear what it was, but that didn't matter because it took it outside the purview of either the insurance regulator and fiscal authorities or the gambling regulator and fiscal authorities. But those of you who read the previous book by uh, Michael Lewis, a book called The Big Short, will know that by 2006 it was actually perfectly clear what was going on in these markets. In 2006, uh, what Lewis called the big short was something called by Goldman Sachs, who promoted it, the abacus transaction. And what happened in the abacus transaction was that a group of uh, a hedge fund manager called John Paulson selected a group of bad mortgages that he thought were particularly likely to fail, which had been packaged into what is called a collateralized debt obligation, you don't really want to know what is in the thousand pages of these complex financial instruments. And then to make a bet, a credit default swap, essentially, on the performance of these particular instruments. And Paulson bet uh, that the uh, collateralized debt obligation would not pay very much and found other people, clients of Goldman Sachs, to take the other side of that particular transaction. We'll come back to Abacus later, but you will see that by that time, what had been going on was this activity had essentially reduced to a form of gambling. That, then, enables us to see the mistake which these people were making at Jackson Hole. They were telling themselves and each other that the trade which was taking place in these markets was like the Swiss villagers getting together to share the risks of bad harvests and, uh, and failures in their, in their flocks, when what was actually happening was that the process was like that in Lloyd's coffee shop, in which people were taking different views on the outcome of the same effect, uh, of the same effect. And that misunderstanding about the nature of the risk market that had developed was essentially what led to the scale of this activity and to the crisis which we saw in, in 2008. Let me put to one side for a moment. As I say, I'll come back to the abacus transaction. But I want to talk now for a little about the second part of uh, the financial services activity we need, which is the process of capital allocation. Back in 2009, Lloyd Blankfein, who was and indeed is the chief executive of Goldman Sachs, gave a rather foolish interview to the Times in which he explained, asked what Goldman Sachs was doing, he explained that it was doing God's work. When the interviewer pressed him on what the deity had in mind when he appointed <laughs> Goldman Sachs to this particular role, he explained that it was, the purpose was capital allocation. That what Goldman did was, he said, took people's savings and provided them for investment in business. It was a virtuous circle, he explained, in which um, uh, uh, the provision of these funds for investment in business uh, enabled companies to grow, create employment, and deliver the products which we, we all need. There were, I think, a couple of misunderstandings in what Mr. Blankfein described as Goldman Sachs business. 
One was that he evidently did, evidently did not know or wish to disclose where the company's profits did in fact come from and that securities issuance, which he was talking about, accounted for less than 10% of that company's revenues uh, over the previous five years. The bulk of that company's activity was and is the kind of trading activity which I described at the beginning of this particular exercise. We'll see the second uh, error uh, mistake in Mr. Goldwyn, in Ms. Blankfein's thing in a moment. Uh, because I want now to look at what the capital allocation process actually is. There are actually two ways we can look at the, the, the capital stock of a country like the UK. We can either go round and measure, see the physical assets, we can see the buildings, uh, the roads, the bridges, the wires under the ground and like, all the things that make up the totality of business investment. And if we do that, the answer we get is the one which I'm showing in this slide. This is what the physical assets of the four countries on the slide, Britain, United States, Germany, and France, actually are. And you'll see the interesting point that the capital stock of a modern economy is predominantly housing. 60% of the capital in the UK today is the housing stock. That similar figure, in Fr similarly about 60% in France. It's a bit less in Germany and the US. But nevertheless, capital is primarily housing. You'll also th see that the remainder of the capital stock divides roughly into three categories. Commercial property, that's offices, shops, industrial premises. Other structures by which we're thinking about roads, bridges, all the parts of the, the physical infrastructure of the country. And then there's plant and machinery, the business investment that Mr. Blankfein was referring to, which is the, 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 the fourth component. That component amounts to about 10% of the total, or slightly more, slightly less, in other countries, which I've looked at there. One of the things you see from that is how Le how much the dependence of the capital stock on business investment has been reduced over the, over the years. We all talk rather glibly about knowledge economies and knowledge businesses. This is the reality of that, that when modern businesses became, began to develop in the 19th century and in, when the stock markets that we know began to develop, the typical business that was raising capital was then a railroad, a railroad is a very capital-intensive business, and the money to finance that railroad had to be raised in penny packets from a very large number of people. But then there's not much you can do with a railroad except run trains on it. And then that particular model of raising money in small amounts from large numbers of people through a stock market was extended to other manufacturing businesses that came into being at the end of the 19th century and the earlier parts of the 20th. Breweries, automobile plants, petrochemical plants and the like. But modern business isn't like that anymore. Modern businesses are Apples and Facebooks and Googles and the like. And these are businesses which are actually generating cash by the time they are large enough to get stock market quotations. One of the odd things that people don't understand was that the stock market, which came into being as a means of getting money into companies, is now a means of getting money out of companies. That's the change in the nature of capital markets, which has arisen. And it's arisen because, first of all, business investment is a much smaller proportion of total national capital. And secondly, because that proportion is itself fungible, by which I mean that it's not specific to the kind of businesses that use it. The capital that Apple does employ in, in its businesses is shops, offices, computers, and the like, all of which need not be owned by the business that uses them and typically isn't. If you've been to the Apple store in Regent Street, you may not know that that is jointly owned by the Queen and the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, but uh, that is who owns it, not Apple itself. The other way in which we can look at uh, uh, the capital stock of the country is 
uh, by going round doors and asking people how rich they are. And this is the, uh, the, the answer we get if we add up the total of these. And one of the things you can see from this is that the total wealth of the country amounts to much the same whichever way you look at it. That is, our savings on the one hand and the capital stock on the other have in aggregate to be much the same. They don't have to be in exactly the same for a variety of reasons, but they are much the same. And you will see that housing plays as large a part, almost as large a part, in terms of net wealth of people in the country as it does in the capital stock of the country. It isn't quite as large a proportion because there is a substantial element of mortgages, that net housing wealth is property value, less the outstanding loans on it. But nevertheless, uh, housing wealth is a large proportion of the capital or right, right, of the capital which is owned by individuals. We should um, draw three conclusions from that. The first is that relative to the size of uh, relative to the size of modern financial market activity, all of these numbers, even though they look large, are relatively small. Remember the number which I gave you at the beginning of total derivative exposure, which was $700 trillion. These amounts are far smaller than that. What we've done is create an elaborate superstructure of financial transactions on the, on the base of a tiny foundation of, of physical assets. Second thing you notice, should notice is that capital allocation in a modern economy is primarily about housing. And the truth is housing finance is not a terribly difficult business. It used to be done relatively well by building society and bank managers in local offices who looked people over and decided whether they were the kinds of people who were likely to pay money back. So much of the activity which I describe at the beginning of this talk is essentially irrelevant to the processes of risk management and capital allocation, uh, which I described earlier. Our companies today are what one might describe as capital light. Capital allocation is principally about housing. And there was one st another mistake which these people at Jackson Hole made when they talked about risk management. They were wrong when they thought about uh, risk management as making the system more resilient. But they were also wrong in another important way. That the risks which they talked about managing better were all these risks which had been created by the superstructure I've described. They were risks which had been created in the, within the financial sector in the first place. The paradox of it all is that just as these people were leaving Jackson Hole to go back in their private jets and limousines to where they had come from, Hurricane Katrina was blowing into New Orleans. That wasn't the kind of risk anyone at Jackson Hole had on their mind. The kind of risks that actually matter to you in this audience and to people in the street are not risks of volatility in financial markets. They're the risks that are to do with natural catastrophes like Hurricane Katrina. They're the risks that are to do with illness and mortality and accident, now extreme longevity as well. They're the risks that are to do with redundancy and unemployment and relationship breakdown. And these are not the risks which the financial market activities I've been describing uh, have, uh, are relevant to. So my critique of the financial services sector today is that we have developed through this process of financialization a very large superstructure, as I've described it, of secondary market trading in existing assets, which is largely irrelevant to the underlying needs of the real economy for capital allocation and risk management. So in the last few minutes of what I have to say this evening, I want to raise the question which I suspect is now all in your minds, which is what should we do about it? Well, when I talk to audiences outside the finance sector, their reaction to being told the kind of things which I've said this evening is to say surely what we need is more regulation. I think that is the wrong answer. In my view, regulation has been a large part of the problem, not the solution. <laughs> 
that what we have done through this era of financialization has been to develop ever more complex rule systems to govern the behavior of financial market players, which have themselves given rise to much of the complexity of the financial system which I've been describing. Mr. Potts was not altogether wrong when he said that the credit default swap was neither gambling nor insurance, because the reason the credit default swap came into existence in the first place was as a form of what is called regulatory arbitrage. The point was that the regulation of insurance companies was done on a different basis to the regulation of lending activities, which meant if you could muddle up the insurance activity with the lending activity, you actually needed to provide less regulatory, regulatory capital than you would have if you had treated it in a straightforward way. That is, regulation created that instrument, which then took on a life of its own and produced the kind of large-scale gambling activity which I described earlier. So regulation which produces ever more complex rule books of the kind which we've seen over the last 30 years is not actually the answer. And the regulation which has been contained in the thousand pages of the American Dodd-Frank Act that followed was passed in 2010, the tens of thousands of pages of regulations which are now built around it, uh, the reaction to the failure of the banking regulatory regime globally known as Basel I and Basel II is, of course, to create Basel III, which is a great deal longer than either Basel I or Basel II are. This way, frankly, madness lies, and it is madness which we are, which are, we are going down. I think we need to adopt an altogether different regulatory approach, which is to focus not on detailed prescriptive rule books, but on the structure of the industry and the incentives of people in it. Let me illustrate. Didn't know how we actually get the sound on this. Ah, right. And the play. Yeah. But did the firm expect you to act in the best interest of your clients? I believe we have a duty to serve our clients well. I guess, Mr. Chairman, that I'm not going to get an answer to my question any more than you did with yours. These are the congressional hearings about the Abacus transaction, which I described earlier, the transaction in which Goldman Sachs sold to its clients a group of uh, uh, these instruments, which had been designed by the hedge fund manager uh, to uh, be based on subprime mortgages when you were likely to fail. This is a bit later. When you heard your employees in these emails, and looking at these deals, said, God, what a shitty deal. God, what a piece of crap. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Did you hear What we need to do is, first of all, focus on the structure of the industry with a view to creating specialist institutions that are not riven by the conflicts of interest which are being described in these particular, in these particular exchanges. Institutions which develop short, simple chains of intermediation between the saver on the one hand and the provider uh, and the user of the capital on the other. We need to do that in order to reduce the costs of the system, 
We need to do that in order to reduce the conflicts of interest which we've been seeing, to improve the transmission of information across the investment chain, in order to achieve risk management that is actually related to mutualization of risks rather than based essentially on gambling. Uh, and we need to do that in order to reduce the complexity, which has been very largely responsible for the, uh, uh, for the instability of the system which we've observed. We also need to emphasize personal responsibility on the part not just of uh, corporations, but of the individuals in these corporations, so that these individuals we've just been looking at feel rather more than just embarrassment, perhaps things a good deal more unpleasant than embarrassment before a congressional committee, when they actually engage in the kind of activities we've been talking about. So we need, above all, to restore that personal, the, that personal responsibility. And uh, I think... I don't think I have anything more to say after that. Thank you all. Thanks, John. So there's some time for a Q&A. So if you have a question, then raise your hand and wait till one of the stewards hands you the microphone and try to keep it uh, concise. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Hello. Oh, thank you very much. Very enjoyable. Um, at the very end, uh, what you said made me think of the uh, press coverage we're getting about the government of the day trying to encourage the Chinese to invest in our nuclear power industry. And I was wondering whether the uh, government had actually noticed that there's something different about the way the Chinese approach capital allocation to the way we do it here in the West. Certainly not clear, it's certainly not clear they do it better, because although there has been massive capital allocation uh, in, in China, it is based to an extraordinary degree on the forced savings of the Chinese population. You will know that China, a, a relatively poor country, has the highest savings rate of any major economy by some distance, and that's not in the main by people's free choice. And much of that capital allocation in China is uh, inefficient. I think the desire to attract Chinese investment is based on a misunderstanding that the source of uh, a failure to realize that the source of finance for our capital stock is essentially our own domestic savings. Although we have uh, a very large global capital market, Essentially, this is all part of the superstructure which I've described. And if you look at British overseas assets, we looked at them at, I think, the end of 2013, at which time the UK had overseas assets of £10.47 trillion and overseas liabilities of £10.63 trillion. You can see that the aggregates are almost the same. The bulk of that actually represents financial market activity, and the net item is very small. Most of our own capital stock is financed in the way we've described by our own savings. The bulk of it, in fact, is housing, uh, and housing is financed either by mortgages or by uh, the equity that people have built up in the houses they own. Middle front row there. Thanks for a lovely presentation. If you could say a word about the way that quantitative easing was, was dealt with, the asset purchasing, um, both the, the US Federal Reserve and the, uh, the Bank of England, and later the ECB, 
created a, a tsunami of liquidity. And as far as most people can see, the net result of that was just to drive asset prices up in terms of, um, I mean, for instance, the art houses here, record prices being paid for fine art, uh, pro London property at an all-time high. Um, and could not that have, as, as has been proposed by Jeremy Corbyn, could not that, could not <coughs> QE have been used perhaps to set up a, nat a national uh, investment bank so that the, those f that, that liquidity could have gone into infrastructure and um, into the, uh, you know, the housing needs it, that the, the, this country faces. I mean, my perception of quantitative easing and its effect is very similar to yours, but then I'm a microeconomist who looks at firms and industries, and there are people in these buildings who will doubtless give explanations of uh, uh, quantitative easing that are at any rate more technical, if not necessarily more relevant, <laughs> than the ones which, we, which you yourself have described. Um, I think, I don't, however, think that what we need is a national investment bank. I think if you look at the analysis which I've given of the role of investment in business today, it is to say that, especially for large firms, we do not, in fact, need more physical investment. It is not that important. What is really important in terms of financing business is what modern business typically needs, which is to fund startup losses in small, innovative businesses. And that is what, in the book I describe, uh, this is a ju juxtaposition that is designed to irritate almost everyone. I talk about the funding of Silicon Valley on the one hand, and the German Mittelstand, the small and medium-sized businesses which make up the success of the German export sector on the other. And that these mechanisms, based on relatively rich people with both finance and specific knowledge in local communities, backing typically individual entrepreneurs, are the main mechanism by which capital allocation can drive innovation and growth in our economies. And that's the thing we need to do better. I don't think a national investment bank would actually have very much to contribute to that particular invest, uh, activity. <coughs> Down here. Uh, thanks also for an excellent lecture. Uh, may I ask, when you um, recommend a much more fundamental look at restructuring finance, um, do you have any sympathies with uh, the idea that a lot of the problems ultimately stem from the fact that we have a fractional reserve banking system as opposed to a 100% reserve system? And a, a second quick, perhaps slightly facetious question is, would you on balance agree with Paul Volcker's view that the best innovation to come out of finance in about the last 60 years has been the cash point machine? I think Volcker may have overstated it, but probably not by much. Uh, and that is relevant to your first point as well, which is the area in which innovation is happening, happening perhaps too slowly, but nevertheless happening, uh, is in the payment system, the, the rather boring utility bit uh, of, the, of the financial system. And that's where a lot of these, as it were, low-paid jobs are going to be eliminated. I think in... Certainly in 50 and perhaps in 20 years, the idea that we went around with bits of paper called currency stuffed in our pockets will seem as absolutely extraordinary. How did people do that? I think it's already, to my mind, to a staggering extent, true that the main use of cash is probably for criminal and near-criminal activity that the discovery that you know, one-third of all the value of euro notes in circulation actually turns out to be 500 euro notes. Has anyone ever seen a 500 euro note? Does anyone know anyone who's ever seen a 500 euro note? I'd rather hope not, as a matter of fact. Uh, so, right, and I think that, that, that changes the role of cash in a way that actually changes everything. But I'm in favor of what the people who talk about abolishing fra fractional reserve banking uh, want to move towards, which is really rather boring traditional banks, which take deposits and put them into safe assets, mainly basically mortgages and government bonds. <laughs> <laughs>
Let me take a question from over there. Uh, you mentioned um, kind of what I call the revolving door of um, kind of Tim Geithner and um, Bernanke and, and Cohen. Uh, I kind of see this as also a perennial problem, and you know you've actually got um, Jamie Diamond and um, Lloyd Blankfield still at the head of some major organisations, and we haven't addressed that problem at all. Yeah, I mean, there are two parts to the issue we're describing there. One is the, uh, what I described as the unimportance of being right. Uh, and the second, which is related to it, is the business of regulatory capture, including what has been described as cognitive capture. That is, the people who regulate the finance industry are people who see the industry through the lenses of the finance sector. Because, in fact, in most cases, there are no other lenses to see uh, to see it, them through. If you want to talk about credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations, the number of people who you, the, the pool of people who can talk to you about these things is actually quite a small one. And not very many of these people will actually be people who are skeptical about the value of the innovation. One at the back there. Hi. Do you think there's been any measures by the government or any other parties taken since the financial crisis that's actually helped us move towards this more real economy-focused financial system that you've described? Well, we've done a bit. Uh, we're, uh, although what has been noticeable in the last few months has been the extent of apparent pushback on that. We we're, were talking about introducing ring fencing of retail banking from other banking activities in the UK, which seems to me a positive move towards the kind of re restructuring move I've described. We're introducing a regime which is designed to put more personal responsibility onto the senior management of large banks, although the Treasury just announced only last week that it was watering down these particular requirements. We're doing a bit, but we, uh, we haven't done anything like the scale of reform that is needed to produce the real economy-oriented finance sector, uh, which, I, which I would like to see. Rahm Emanuel famously said, Obama, one of Obama's advisors, now mayor of Chicago, uh, said in 2008, you should never let a good crisis go to waste. But that, of course, is exactly what happened. On the front here. Uh, hello. Um, there's a lot of uh, banks and corporations that are starting to gain a lot of importance under the label of ethical banking, whose uh, one of the main purposes of them is uh, allocating savings to pro projects in the real economy. So do you think that if people put the savings, their personal savings, into these, uh, into these banks, that would actually help in uh, the problem of financialization? Uh, I mean, this activity is not doing any harm, but is absolutely at the fringes uh, of the finance sector. In my view, unless we not only reform the, the, the finance sector in the way I've described, but reduce the political influence of the established finance sector, we will not make much progress uh, in achieving the kind of results I've been talking about. Um, <clears throat> nothing's been mentioned about ratings agencies so far. Um, if they hadn't have put, given such great ratings to these collateral, collateralized debt obligations, we wouldn't have been in such a problem. What about, what do you think should happen to them in the future so that they are honest brokers? Because at the moment, I don't think they are. Well, there are, in my mind, there are two problems arising from rate, in relation to rating agencies. One is the way in which they have been, by regulation, given, as it were, a formal role within the financial system. So that we've created the world in which people are obliged to hold certain amounts of paper, uh, which acquired particular ratings. Uh, 
Um, I think that's inappropriate, especially combined with the other uh, aspect, which started in the 1970s through the era of financialization, in which the ratings agencies were paid by the issuer uh, of, the, uh, of the security rather than by the investor in the security. That created a conflict of interest, which was fundamental to the problems which we describe. I remember starting to understand a bit more about how the financial crisis was evolving back in 2006 when I talked at some length to someone who was setting up one of these structures in one of the large banks that was selling these complicated financial instruments. And I came to realize that although he was involved in the group devising the structure, he did not himself understand how they had worked. The way they were created was they were reverse engineered to work their way through the rating agency model. That is, you in effect, through structures at the rating agency model, which you, you knew quite a bit about anyway, until you found one that worked. And at that point, you could go out and sell it to your customers. And right in the middle there, if we can get a mic to you. John, upstairs. Ah, sorry, I'm... Hi, thanks. You mentioned both uh, ring fencing and the senior manager's regime as not going far enough. Um, what, what is your vision for what uh, is needed to go as far as required? Uh, I mean, my vision on, on, when I say ring fencing is not going far enough, I would like to see not just ring fencing, but actually the breakup of financial services conglomerates into specialist financial institutions. If you ask what the modern investment bank, the Goldman's of the world, actually do, you come up with a list of functions which run securities issuance, market making, corporate advice, asset management, own account trading. You just have to start listing these, li listing these functions to see that all of them are to some degree in conflict with every other. Uh, so we would start by addressing these conflicts of interest. We would also, I would hope, see asset managers in the short, simple chains of intermediation who had rela close relationships with at least one of savers and the companies in which money was invested or right, savers, or the companies in which money was invested, or preferably both, and so on. It's that structural group of structural issues which, would like, or which one would like to address. And I would also like to deal with, as it were, the, the Casablanca problem uh, by imposing, as the, uh, as the senior manager's regime is moving towards, direct responsibility for what is going on in your organizations, which you cannot evade uh, by simply denying knowledge of what was going on in these organizations. That's a, a, a kind of, allowing that defense is in my view, not just letting people off the hook, but is actually corroding the culture because it, it makes sense for people not to have knowledge of what is actually going on within their organizations. Um, if you take the um, total money supply available in the UK, only 3% is created by the Bank of England. 97% is created by private banks as a, de as a debt. And the private banks currently are allocating, the capital allocation, they decide where in the economy it goes into. And like you said earlier, most of it goes into housing because that's the safest bet. Sh sh uh, shouldn't we be looking at more radical macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomic reform systems rather than just tinkering the current system we have today? I mean, first of all, for reasons I was describing earlier, I don't want to get up, hung up on the amount of cash there is around. I think the whole discussion around cash, money supply and the like is the product of a much simpler world uh, in, which, uh, in which money genuinely consisted of cash and bank deposits. We now have such a wide range of forms of credit, of shadow banking activities and the like, that money is no, in the traditional sense is no longer quite the key to that. Um, should banks be lending on housing? Of course they should be lending on housing because housing is most of what the assets are. 
Uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. Although I do see things wrong with a world in which we have so much excess liquidity introduced by governments into the financial system that we are constantly pushing up house prices. Although I'm not sure that's the principal driver in the UK behind the rise in house prices, but that's a story for another day. Um, thanks for the interesting lecture. Although I have to say I disagree with some points. To challenge you, one thing you said, secondary trading is very irrelevant. Um, just wondering, I mean, for every primary issue, you look at secondary prices. So to price a primary issue, you look, if a company brings a new bond, you look at the existing bonds. If there's no existing bonds, you look at the bonds of the peer group or benchmarks or whatever. So why do you exactly think secondary trading is irrelevant? I don't think secondary trading is irrelevant. I think we just don't need very much of it. You know, most of our savings, as I was describing, are either in housing or they're in institutionalized. Uh, most of us are saving for long-term goals and long-term objectives. The bulk of saving in the UK economy is either housing wealth or it is retirement saving. Uh, if markets opened once a month, probably once a year, they would provide mo quite enough liquidity for, for these long-term investment purposes. I would like to see much less active markets in secondary trading combined with focused portfolios on the part of both asset managers and banks uh, in which these... Uh, these investing institutions knew a great deal more than they do currently about the underlying investment uh, uh, activities in which they were investing. Uh, so the idea that we need hyperactive markets in hyperactive secondary markets in order to achieve primary issuance, especially given the unimportance of primary issuance in the modern economy anyway, is, I think, a mistake. Professor Kay, um Thanks for the lecture and thanks for your book, which is as lucid as ever. Um, in your book, and you didn't say it in the lecture, you suggest that your reforms are unlikely to be taken up anytime soon for a number of reasons, cognitive capture, regulatory capture, etc. What sort of tipping points, what sort of event do you foresee that actually would change the culture, change the mindset of politicians to enact these sorts of regulations? I think, I think it's another crisis on the scale of 2008 or larger uh, that actually um, changes the political dynamics, which are at the moment driven to such a large degree by the entrenched power of the financial services industry. And I don't look forward to that crisis, but it seems to me the mechanisms of crisis are still very largely in place, and that seems to me highly likely. Uh, my fear is that what we have at the moment is a kind of widespread but unfocused public anger, which is reflected in the, the willingness of people in all around the world now to vote for crazy guys whose main characteristic is that they're not mainstream politicians. We'll take one or two more from down below, perhaps there. Well, a huge fan of your column, been for many years. Um, I'm Tom, and I work for uh, work for a startup actually who wants to eliminate cash. And my question is, uh, you you mentioned the uh, small business financing um, on the model of Silicon Valley and Mittelstand, which is driven by you know knowledge and relationships, and has big virtues for innovation, right? Yeah. Um, my question is more, do you see the downside of that and also related to how you said the public stock market has changed uh, uh, compared to maybe in the past where it was putting money in but now it's driving money out and I think that's part of also how we see the tech market evolving. So do you see a problem there with inequality even though it's good innovation? Um, it will make very few people very rich. Um, yeah, uh, there are several interesting points in all of that. Uh, I think the fundamental one is, for me, the stock market as we have known it is essentially a creature of the 20th century. It came into existence to solve the business financing problems 
of the late 19th, first half of the 20th century. And it has become, as I was describing, increasingly irrelevant to any part of the real economy. <coughs> I, I, I think it is the case uh, that um, inequality actually makes a real contribution to innovation and growth because it's what has happened in Silicon Valley has, has actually been in large part that some people made a lot of money in various early stages of tech booms in, in, in Silicon Valley and had both the cash and the expertise to fund future startups. Uh, my view on that is that there are better and worse versions of inequality. And I think not many people mind the fact that Bill Gates is very rich because they can see what Bill Gates actually contributed to business and people's lives. And he behaves relatively well, you know, with the extraordinary fortune that he has, has accumulated. I think most people I know do not have the same feeling about some of the fortunes that have been made in the financial services sector, and I think with good reason. Take one from up there. Right. One and two. In your book, uh, you say that one of the problems with regulatory agencies was that they perhaps struggle in the, the middle ranks to, to attract the best of the best because, uh, for among other reasons, the, the salaries are low compared to what they could uh, attract in the private sector. Uh, and my question is simply, does that amount to a recommendation that the uh, the officials at the Bank of England and the FCA should be paid double or triple, most likely, what they're, they're being paid at the moment in order to attract um, top people? Um, I think, I fear we're always going to find that the poachers will pay more than the gamekeepers. Um, and indeed, it seems to me we have enough of a problem finding competent people to run financial institutions once to employ other equally competent people to second-guess what they're doing. seems to me both unrealistic and undesirable. I think we have to move instead in the opposite direction, which is to say we, we understand the limited capacities of regulation and regulators and build regulation that can actually be implemented by them. If the people we can hire for regulatory agencies are box stickers, then we need to have a system of regulation that can be implemented by ticking boxes. Sort of a further question on the regulatory framework. So one of the things that came out of the crisis, at least in the UK, was the establishment of the Financial Policy Committee as a macroprudential authority. It's the idea to look at the financial system as a whole rather than individual institutions. And it's now also been asked to have due regard to the provision of productive investment in the UK. So given everything that you've said, first I, I wondered whether you think the productive investment angle of that remit is now a bit of an unhelpful distraction. And secondly, in the way that the financial system is configured at the moment, and then also in your kind of ideal view of how it should be, is there a role for macroprudential uh, regulation or a macroprudential view in addition to just regulating individual banks and insurers? I mean, first of all, I'm not sure that people doing so-called macroprudential regulation are likely to be very good at it. Uh, that's certainly been our experience uh, in the past. So uh, I am frankly skeptical of that. I'm even more skeptical of what I think you're describing as the general reaction to the 2008 crisis, which was to say if we have a problem of financial stability, we appoint a committee of people whose job it is to ensure financial stability. I'm afraid that's a long way short of actually finding mechanisms for achieving financial stability. To get to that, we have to address the issues which I've been describing, which relate to the structure of the industry. Should we take one more right in the middle there? Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation. First of all, it's only one month that I'm in London, so 
loving the British sense of humor for the... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, first of all, what would have happened in, in Europe, uh, in Euro financial sector, if in, for example, 2010, after the crisis, uh, we would have restructured our debt. And the second question is, uh, like CDS and Abacus transactions can be referred as uh, someone buying your car insurance and making you have a crash with your car, something like this. It, it is interesting, actually, if we go back to these people uh, in Lloyd's coffee shop, uh, that quite a lot of the gambling they did in Lloyd's coffee shop was actually on other people's lives. And it was decided in the, in the mid-18th century that that was really quite a bad idea. Uh, and since then, we've had an insurance law that says you can only gamble on someone else's life if you actually can show that you would make some loss if that particular person died. You're, you're related to the person in some way. That doesn't eliminate the problem altogether, but it helps quite a lot. Um, sorry, the, the, your second question was, well, what would have happened if we'd restructured in 2010? Well, I think a large part of the reason why we have this continuing Eurozone crisis, it originated, in my mind, in some of the carry trades which I've described, in which there were profits to be made by essentially borrowing money in Northern Europe and lending it out in, in the South. Uh, and even if that might end in tears at some time in the future, it probably wasn't going to be any time soon. It was, as it were, picking up dimes under the steamroller or, or tailgating. And eventually, well, it wasn't quite the crash came or the steamroller moved, but at any rate, it started to slip. Um, so I think, right, the problem in large part lay, and ha lay in, um, in French and German banks, which had behaved in these kind of ways, and that problem was essentially taken on uh, to the balance sheets of the European Central Bank. And we don't quite know how the, uh, the debts and the weak collateral that has been the result of that uh, will be resolved. The one thing uh, we can be sure of is that the money is gone and it's not coming back. Should we take one more question? Right, you, sir. I'm sorry, people in the middle are really rather far away for purposes of getting mics to them. Uh, so thank you, for Professor Key, for your presentation. Uh, you've mentioned about the uh, more regulation is not necessary in modern uh, in right now um, in, in your presentation. But uh, the thing is that uh, the uh, as the Federal Reserve government and the other governments uh, related to the financial uh, conduct uh, have been announced once and again that um, it is really important to add more regulation after 2008. So how if there is more law paper? Uh, as you said before, and more regulation being added to the uh, financial industry, especially the banking industry. How if that really happens afterward? I think what we have at the moment is a, a regulatory structure uh, that is, uh, on the one hand, very extensive and very intrusive, you know, and on the other, it's largely captured by the industry and it's ineffective in achieving its primary public policy goals. And if one says these things, I think one has said enough to say that we need to think about doing something different. And that's where I would like us to be. Thank you all. Well, one final announcement. If you want to buy the book and get it signed, you can buy it outside. And then the idea is you come back over here to the stage and get it signed.